Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks very much for joining us. We're joined by two of Ireland's leading anglers. I'm going to big you up, lads. Uh, Andy Burnett and Rory Keating from Inland Fisheries Ireland, who have a wealth of information to share with you today. Um, the two guys have never worked a day in their lives because they're into fishing and they work in fishing. So um, they're, they're, they're those people who have found exactly what they want. So we're, we're going to try and keep it an open. There should be closed captioning available. Sorry, I need to mention that down the bottom of your screen. Um, have, if you click roll over the CC button, um, closed captioning is available. And um, please avail of that service. And also we'll be able to, you'll be able to save the manuscript at the end of today's Shedcast. And the other point to say is that uh, Andy and Rory are here to answer questions, any and all questions as they come in. So uh, don't be shy, feel free to get involved and ask anything that you may have. Um, where it's an open forum. So I'm gonna hand over to Rory, who's gonna take it away and talk about fly tying, rod upcycling, some of the courses inland fisheries offer. Normally the plan is to offer them directly into the shed. But as we live in the virtual world and we're a bit constrained at the moment with lockdown and um, social restrictions, they will, they're will they interested in seeing if there's an interest from Sheds to explore this as an online course. But um, hopefully towards the end of the year, as we all get back to normal, it's something that we can do in the Sheds as well. So either or. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to you, Rory. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to be here. I'm delighted to be here. This is a great opportunity to chat to you about what we might be able to do. I'm just going to check, Andy, can we all see my screen? All right, these slides. I think you're probably on the presenter's view. Uh, yeah. I'll leave it like that. Yeah, you're on presenter's view, yeah. yeah. We can all see. There's not going to be many things, slides to look at. Uh, we're going to keep it very text-like. You'll be pleased to hear. So we're just here to literally talk to you about two programs that we talked to the men's shed about earlier on last year, which we we're going to try and roll out before we got hit by lockdowns. Um, and then maybe a little option on what we might be able to do online. And at the end, then we'll have as many questions as we can possibly take. Um, just by the way of introduction, um, my name is Rory Keating. Um, I work with uh, the Dublin Angling Initiative which is a section of IFI where we bring uh, young children out all around Dublin and try and introduce them to fishing. Um, kind of the reason I got into working in IFI is because I love fishing. I'm an angler myself. And that's my passion. And I've been doing this for the last three years. And I'm, I guess I'm blessed. And that that's my, my bread and butter is going out and bringing people around the country. Well, you know, bringing out Dubliners mostly out fishing. Um, and Andy, do you want to say a quick bit about how you got into it? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Andy Burnett. Uh, likewise, same as Rory there. I uh, got a job in Inland Fisheries, uh, started uh, last January, uh, basically because I'm a mad keen angler, have been all my life since I was six years old. Um, and it was just a dream job. I've been applying for it for years and years, but lucky enough to get in eventually. And it's it's just... It really is what Rory says. It doesn't feel like work anymore because you're taking people out doing what you love and teaching them, um, teaching them the skills of fishing. Uh, um, and to see the, the joy that it brings to people on a daily basis is just absolutely fantastic. That's it. So look, at we're first and foremost, we're, we're anglers, we're fishermen, and we just happen to have landed a great job. I think that's the simplest way of putting it. So look, we were talking to Frank earlier yeah. on here about what we might be able to do with you. And um, the two programs we came up at the time were a pike fly tying program and a rod upcycling project. Um, that was before COVID hit. And then in an effort then to offer something, maybe while we're all stuck at home, we thought we might come up with some online fishing courses that are kind of taken from what we're doing with some of the youth groups around the country. I'll come to that at the end. But I think just for now, we'll just fly through what our ideas were for the both the pike flying and the rod upcycling. So, um, the rod upcycling, initially we thought of these are going to be indoor sessions, obviously, so it'll be, it'll be dependent on when we can actually travel again to meet you guys in various parts of the country. Um, and look, that's just the reality of the world. We have to wait and see uh, the restrictions at the moment. 
our idea initially was we try and keep it small so we can really try and help teach people. So it'll be four participants and two instructors, which would probably be one of me or Andy and then another expert in pipe flies. Um, and we try and come around to your um, sites. Um, at the moment, we don't really know what the interest is. So this is kind of what we're here today to find out is, um, I know there were some Dublin groups uh, involved who weren't well keen. We just want to see whether there's interest around the country or not. You now, Andy had organized already possibly um, working with the men's shed in Cassari. And I yep. put up just, if you guys can let us know today, great, but I'm going to give the, those email addresses there to just get in touch with us and let us know what the interest is like so that when then we can try and organize these sessions around the country when we can all move again. Um, I'll, I'll come back to those email addresses, but just in case you want to jot them down, they're there now. Uh, I see the first chat coming in. Can you see everyone on the screen? Uh, I, can I think you need to check in. your settings there, Paul. I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to take these, I'll tell you what, these, these um, slides will be down in a second because they're not going to be up for much longer. We're only looking them up very briefly, if that's okay, Paul, and then we'll see everybody. Yeah, Paul, you'll just be able to see this. Uh, you'll just be able to see the speakers, Paul. But if you have a question, um, just fire it on the chat like that and we'll be able to work to it. Thanks. So very quickly on the fly time, because I know Andy's going to show you some flies now in a second. Uh, just to summarize, we'll provide the instructors and all the materials. You don't need to bring anything at all. Uh, we just need participants and a venue, so a shed around the country. Um, that's the idea. Andy, do you want to just say a little quick bit about pipe yep. flies? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how many lads have fished that are on here before, but um, pike fly fishing has, has really come to the forefront um, as a way of predator fishing in the last sort of 15 to 20 years. And it seems to be getting more and more popular. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that do pike fish um, with flies predominantly now. Um, and it is regularly um, responsible for, for bringing fish in of well over 20 pounds. Um, I know certainly last year there were a couple of fish caught near 30 pound on the fly, which is a, it's a hell of a fish to catch on a fly rod. Um, the beauty about it is there's any weird and wonderful shapes and colours, as I'll just show you here. There's, that's one that were recently tied by one of the instructors. Um, as you can see, doesn't resemble any type of fish that swims in Irish waters, but the pike seem to love them. So we've got from the big and fluffy and wonderful ones there to... We've got much smaller ones here that resemble a, um, almost a fry when they're in the water. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a real nice way of fishing, a nice day out on the bank. Um, and that, that all important pull when you get it on the line is, uh, is enough to get everybody's heart beating a little bit faster on the day. Nice one, nice one. I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, what else do I have in this slide here? Yeah, we get the big fish on the fly now. It's quite exciting. Um, yeah um i think that one of the real yeah, things to that, that, sorry you go andy yeah one, one of the things that we sort of thought with the men's sheds is i know from my experience of dealing with men's sheds in the past and stuff um a lot of lads like to be tinkering with things and maybe set up a small business so that they can get some um Re resell things and stuff. I know a lot of lads locally around by me do woodwork and stuff like that. Um, that's certainly an option with the pike fly business because they're quite hard to get hold of in a lot of places. Um, they, as I say, they are quite sought after. Um, they're not that difficult to tie once you've had some tuition. Um, and the retail value of a pike fly can range from this one here can sell for maybe five or six euros up to your big double jointed ones and bigger than that that can sell for 15 to 20 euros so you know there is there's room for quite a decent revenue return on them um, which we thought might be of interest to some of the lads in the sheds as well um look i think we've come we've kind of explained what that is now i'll, I'll quickly go and talk to you about the rod exciting program so this is the other program we thought we'd go with so similarly we'll provide all the instructors we'll provide all the bits and pieces the equipment uh, and to start off with, certainly we provide all the bits of the old rods and reels that we might want to fix up. 
Um, what we would encourage is you might want to bring along your own rod initially just to have a look at with us because we can't really just take everything and anything you've got at the moment, but hopefully teach you some of the skills then that might be applicable to fixing up your own bits and pieces. So it'd be kind of, we'll provide the initial equipment, but then with the idea that you'll be able to fix up your own gear yourselves. And I suppose that the, apart from what Andy was saying about maybe making a slight bit of income out of it is it's just a way of keeping that favorite rod. And uh, that's the main thing for me yeah. is you might have something that you just don't want to lose. Um, so as I said, we'll provide the equipment to yeah. start. Um, great to repair and upgrade. We'll be, we'll be looking at reels as well. So not just rods, but hopefully servicing your old reels. Um, but bring along your old equipment and we'll have a look at it. Um, so those were the two projects we had thought of last year that we thought that the sheds might be interested in. Um, We'll, we'll take a lot of questions about them now afterwards. I'm just going to briefly touch on then what we thought in the interim was since we're all locked down. Um, and I will point out that, as you can probably tell, Andy and I would be particularly um, unfriendly with technology. It's not our comfort zone. It's not where I want to be is sitting behind a computer screen, but it is where we're at at the moment. Um, so we've been doing angling online courses for angling to some youth groups around the country. And on the back of that, we just thought we'd try and put together some basic introduction sessions on the different types of angling. So probably around an hour each, if you can get us to stop talking, um, really we do one on each of the, the disciplines. So one on course, one on game, and game could be broken into trout and then and salmon, uh, one on pike fishing, and then one on sea fishing. And just to introduce the basics of those particular types of angling and where and how you might go about doing those in Ireland. Um, so again, just depending on what's, what the demand is, what you guys would like us to do, uh, we're very happy to take suggestions on that and see if there's any interest in that. It's not my favorite cup of tea sitting behind the computer uh, screen, but it's something we can do at the moment. And if, look, if there's any interest in it, we'd be delighted to, to offer that to you. So I, I'll put yeah, up the content. Sorry, you far away, Andy. Yeah, just what I was going to say there on, uh, like Rory was saying about the courses, certainly where the course fishing is concerned and the pike fishing is concerned, if there's any groups out there that are um, experienced anglers um, and they want to upskill, um, certainly where the course fishing is concerned, I can go into a lot of different technical sort of lessons and stuff. Um, I mean, I've fished at international level and I've been fishing for nearly 40 years. So I do a lot of competition fishing and that sort of stuff. So if, if it is a case that anybody wants to upskill and there's something to think that we can go through with them, then that's that's an option as well. So He does catch a lot of fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to stop the slides there because I think at this stage, that's just given a little introduction to, to what we can offer, and this is really where I think is important is to see what your interest might be like. And if anyone's got any questions, so fire into the chat box there and let us know. Um, Frank, is there anything you wanted to say just before yeah, we- Yeah, no, we absolutely. And um, in fact, one question, Anthony O'Reardon, and, and there, there's a range of questions depending on skills. Anthony O'Reardon from the Raytown Men's Shed uh, in Rings End in Dublin asks, He's dabbled a bit in fishing off the south wall, if anyone's familiar with it, near the chimneys. And then of late, with more success, he adds uh, John Leary Pier um, catching whiting. Um, he just asked the general question about license. As, as a beginner, wh what's the license requirement situation with regards both sea angling and game angling? If you could just give an overview for the beginners out there. That would be great. Do you want me to jump in, Andy? Because I know the South Wall and I can definitely like, tell you on this one. <laughs> um, Absolutely. The best thing about sea angling, and it's one of the reasons I am always promoting sea angling, is 99% of it, there's no license requirement at all. There's nobody telling you you can and can't fish anywhere. The sea isn't private. Nobody owns it. So in general, you just go for it at sea. Now, there are three fish to be cognizant of, and that's salmon, trout, so sea trout, and then bass or sea bass. And if you're deciding to fish for salmon, well, the first thing I'd say is you do need to have a license for those fish. So the same as if you're fishing for salmon or trout, 
on a river. You'd need a salmon and sea trout license. But that's only for those two species. And you really are getting into very specific style of fishing for those two. Um, the other one to be aware of is bass. You don't need a license for bass, but there are rules as to how many bass you can catch a day now, and they change. So I'm not going to stay here and say, at the moment, you can only catch one bass a day because it, it's changing. I'm hoping that it's kind of stabilized a bit because these rules have come down from Europe and we're being told what you can and can't catch at the moment. And it's has been quite confusing, but just take it from me. If you're fishing for bass, just check out, ask the local lads, check, ring us by all means. That's what we're there for. Check on the website, ask in your tackle shop, what's the story with bass at the moment? And just be aware that rule of thumb is kind of, you can keep one a day. Other than that, everything at sea, it's one of the best things about sea fishing is you can do what you want. Like there's no rules. It's, it's, it's free. It's there. It's a resource. Use it. And that's why I'm always encouraging the kids that we're teaching a lot of the time to go learn sea fishing because it's such an amazing variety of species and you don't have to worry about those. I was just going to say the exact same thing. There's so many species to chase at sea as well. You know, it doesn't get monotonous because it can be different on every day you go out is different. Like so. and as, a, as a rough rule of thumb, and I know there's uh, a, I know as a very rough rule of thumb, seasons, I'm familiar as a young man catching mackerel with feathers and it was always sort of July, August into September. They talk about the blues running up near Hoth Head um, a certain time of year. Is, is this the information that fishermen don't share or can you give us a bit of a steer <laughs> on the, 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 the better seasons for whiting or whatever you have? What's well, the- certainly whiting tends to be um, a winter fish. Um, they tend to move into the waters in winter, same as codling. Um, and you tend to catch numbers of callies. Um, flatfish are brilliant this time of year because they're feeding up pre-spawning now. Uh, they're getting ready to spawn and they're at the sort of best condition. Um, I know one of the one of the groups that I follow there, uh, the Killybegs Mariners, they were out uh, last weekend and one of the lads had 37 flounder in one evening. Like So, you know, it's, it's some serious, serious shore angling to be had. Um, and then again, like you say, going into the, the sort of spring and summertime, that's my favourite time to get out sea fishing. You've got your pollock fishing, your ling fishing, um, and then, like you said there, the blues, blue shark fishing is outstanding off the coast, off the west coast particularly. Um, we've had some huge blues off there, but that season generally doesn't tend to start until about mid to late August and then kind of runs through to November, depending on the rough, you know, how rough it is if you can get out um but yeah there's this lots of different species at different time of year to catch like so just a bit of an insight yeah and i suppose on that if i just made there are more seasons really when it comes to inland fishing so you have um those two that we were mentioning that do need a license when you're on your rivers and lakes the trout and salmon there is a closed season where you, you can't fish for them and the reason we have a closed season is to let them spawn so exactly as andy said same as all fish need to have a time to spawn. So for trout and salmon, we close our rivers and lakes when they need to spawn to give them a chance, and then they come back open. So traditionally, the open season starts around now. Some rivers it starts at the beginning of January. Some rivers it doesn't start till I think the first of April. Again, you might just want to check if you're getting licenses for trout and salmon. Just check on that one. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, look, all, all fish have a time when they need to spawn. So you predominantly chase them at certain times. I know that like pike fishing, you fish for pike all year round. Pike get particularly big when they spawn. So you get the big ones coming yep. into bays, spawning bays. Now, no. <laughs> February, when you were locked down and we yeah. can't move. <laughs> I think um, can get out. <laughs> but this is, the, this is the goal time for pike because you're actually going, you're chasing them when they're big to spawn to get the really big ones. That's what you're kind of doing. But and again, I suppose we, we can't say enough catch and release for those lads you really have to make sure you're treating your fish really well to put them back because they are going to be spawning so you've got to make sure you're you're treating them particularly well when, when you think that they're about to spawn and that's yeah. a big one and then just to, to, if, again from a novice point of view if i was to like where would you is the best license information available say if i was thinking of heading down the country and it 
before I take the rod out of the car or whatever and, and drop it in the lake? How do you check out areas like that? How do you, is it on your own website? Is it? Yeah, we have information on our website, but our rule at home, the first rule I always said on years before I ever joined IFI or knew even what the fisheries boards were, was you find your local tackle shop. So you find out where, if you're going to Leitrim, where's the nearest tackle shop to me? You call into them and you say, how are you lads? We're thinking of going to wherever the lake or river is, what's the story? And they'll be able to tell you there and then, well, it was really good last week. And that's what they usually say to you, isn't it? But it's not going to be as good now. Um, and also what you might, how best to fish it. And then also if there are any closed seasons, so in other words, if it's closed for any reason in particular, and it might be something like, there was a pollution incident there last week. There's nothing going on. Like it, the fish have all been knocked out for the next couple of weeks. You want to, you're wasting your time. You'll be better off going somewhere else. You'll get all your local information in a local tackle shop. And I can't emphasize that enough because definitely. Whilst Dublin's great and we have some fantastic shops here, there's no point in me asking the lads in Dublin what the fishing is like down in Bantry at the moment, you know? <laughs> yeah, very good. That, that, uh, you mentioned it yourself, Andy, uh, both. Uh, fly tying and rod up cycling uh, present some realistic uh, revenue opportunities for men's sheds if there's an interest yeah. in it um, and I suppose that, that leads to the question is is fly tying to a certain extent is it, is it local knowledge in a way are, are certain will, will certain lures in certain areas be more attractive to the fish based the Floral. There definitely would be. Sorry, Frank. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, there would be an element of that. But generally speaking, um, my experience of it and a lot of lads that I've spoken to down the years is as long as it's got something flashy in it, <laughs> they'll have a go at it. <laughs> you know, um, so they tend to be. <laughs> Yeah, they tend to be generic patterns that will look that will imitate natural food fish. So it'll be whether it be roach, perch, maybe a baby trout, something like that. That the, the a pike would naturally chase in the water. We try and get them sort of colours. Um, apart from that one that you can see is got a garish pink belly on it. I don't know what fish is a garish pink belly, but you know we throw all sorts of colours in. Just I think a lot of it catches the angler as opposed to the fish. You know. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I got a, we have a quick question here from the, the chairman of the Bluebell Fishing Club uh, and he's asking about uh, Paul. you know Paul Holmes yes and uh, any chance of stock a stocking program on the canal as there's literally no fish I know if there's room for fish with all the traffic cones and shopping trolleys but uh, over to you Rory <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Look, look yeah, that, and that's something we have done before: is, is putting fish into the canals. And look, we're always trying to source fish, and, and Paul might know that from 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 days with me before. But uh, I suppose at the moment it's very tricky because obviously the logistics at the moment of moving fish is is hugely difficult. But um, hopefully, once restrictions are eased again, we can start actually going and finding fish around the country. Um, get in touch with us. That's that's the best advice I can say is is really get in touch with, with IFI. Um, we have to be careful. Moving fish is not as easy as just picking up a fish in one part of the country and and dumping it in another. You, even for us, there's a huge amount of paperwork that has to be done because of the potential for moving disease around the country. So we, if we ever move fish, we have to make sure that where they're coming from, the fish are healthy, which means doing a sample on them and then making sure that where they're going to is healthy as well because you don't want to be moving a lot of healthy fish from one part of the country into a polluted pond and another part but yes absolutely i mean i'd love to hope and hoping that we can do a lot more of that kind of work uh, it is very tricky at the moment um the, the canals the canals actually and, and paul might notice the canals are they're very difficult to fish and one of the reasons they've become more and more difficult to fish is a, a strange one it's because we've actually cleaned them up an awful lot over the years um, and the canals, the water moves quite quickly in them and they're clean. So the water is less polluted and the fish can see you. And that's the basics of it. And if you can fish the canals well, you'll end up beating Andy on the Irish teams because you become an <laughs> unbelievably good angler. You have to be to catch fish. They are so difficult to fish. And the weird thing is we had a, 
we had a recent, um, last year we had an incident actually just below Blueba where we had to remove fish quickly. There was a, there was a, a I think a, the part of the canal burst, I think it was a, something happened to it. Oh, and yes. uh, we had to remove fish out of it quickly. And we couldn't believe the amount of fish that were in a one and a half kilometer stretch of the canal. Um, they, they are there, it's just, they're so difficult to fish. And yeah, look, I, I'd love to be putting more in the whole time, but again, get in touch with us and we'll do what we can. We will, we really will. Cause I know that stretch in Bluebell does need, does need regular stocking. Or maybe the Bluebell fishermen just aren't that good. And the fish are really <laughs> well, I wasn't there. going to say it directly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Paul Holmes. I'll be getting that in the neck. Uh, Con Lawler asks, what's the best way to catch a bicycle or a shopping trolley? I think three and one is the latest advice on uh, catching <laughs> anything like that. Um, for someone who's new to fly fishing, uh, I know the whole element of the cast, and, and this is coming from a, a sort of a, I was brought up in it with sea angling and you know, throwing a line off a pier is difficult. I won't get it wrong, having caught a few family members with the hook. But fly fishing is a completely different cast and, and, and situation. And as a friend of mine used to go to the local GAA club to practice um, when you were allowed. Any tips on, on, on that whole area? Um, any instruction? Um, Am I, I might jump in on that one, Rory. Um, I'm not, um, I don't profess to be any sort of expert when it comes to fly fishing. Um, I have done a good bit of it in my younger years. Um, and just having recently done some tuition with a, a professional fly caster, um, that's what I would advise anybody who's thinking about fly fishing is try and find a... Um, a fishery, a put and take fishery where they've got either got an instructor on there or try and find a, a fly casting instructor. And even if you can just spend a half an hour with them, the knowledge that you will gain off them and the techniques that you will learn is it'll far outweigh spending two or three weeks on the bank, whipping the water to a foam and getting frustrated, tying knots around the end of your rod with a fly line. You know, um, that's that, that would be my advice to anybody starting off fly fishing now. And that would be something a shed could do if there was three or four members in the shed. They could they could probably commission or ask somebody to come in, uh, absolutely, and, and coach a group. Yeah, and yeah. again, if you're looking That's, for advice on that, contact us because we can certainly definitely. point you in the right direction. And there there are really 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 good instructors in Ireland. Um, and if you're like me and you spent years kind of half learning yourself, it takes a long time to get rid of those bad habits. Whereas if you're starting from scratch and you go and get the good habits straight away, your quid's in. Yeah, yeah, go, go to yeah. a pro. But, but it, is, yeah. it is hard work, it is hard work and it is something that requires practice. And you're, you're mentioning going to the, the back to the pitches, that's what I do and that's what people do. And you, you put in the hours, it's muscle memory and you have a bit of cotton wool probably at the end of your line and you're casting two and three hundred casts on the football pitch in the evenings that's the kind of way you do you know it's it is that's the reality of it but it is amazing to be able to do it it is a skill that's um you, you, you'll be learning for life to be honest with you yeah yeah no it, and it, when it's well done it looks so a so easy but b so elegant so uh, it's I, like an art form yeah yeah i i can imagine um, one of the one of the big things men sheds are all about is uh, trips and day trips and, and and getting out there. And I know I've from again back from younger days uh, trout farms and the like. Um, now I'm not asking you to endorse as an organisation any or, or rule out any, but what would be your top three sort of fishing trips if you were to say to a group of fellas, here's a great way of just getting a taster for a one day trip, whether it's, a, you know, just a round trip to, and it depends on where they're based. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, maybe I think we might both have slightly different ideas on this. So I'll, I'll go first on this one, Frank, and then let's let Rory go take, with this. Take it um, away, Andy. You give him more time to think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would say um, a charter boat. Definitely a charter boat off from where I live on the west coast of Ireland, but equally on the east coast as well. Um, and any, in fact, anywhere around the country, we are so lucky for the, the just the sheer brilliance of the of the sea fishing that's on offer is unbelievable. And it only gets better when you go out on a boat. If you get out with a decent skipper, and certainly we can point people in the direction decent skippers. Um, 
a good skipper will tell you everything if you're fishing over rough ground, smooth ground, the depth you're fishing at, where the fish are, what you're likely to intercept them with. And it really does make a difference. You know, all the lads have great crack out on the boat. You know, some of them might get a little bit woozy and look a bit green behind the gills, you know, and they may kiss the stone when they come back in. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that once or twice. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's, it's a great day out. Yeah, that's a good one. That's very good, yeah. I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I, I sort of go, I make reference to Paul Holmes again, if you don't mind, Paul. We had the Bluebell men's shed out. Um, I was going to say last year, but actually it's the year before now. Um, and we started off, we went for a day trip from Dublin down to um, Wicklow. And we went to Ockram, I think it was. And there's a, it's a trout lake, put and take facility and great place to start to learn, start fishing, give it a go. Um, there's good fish in it. You can keep a couple if you want to. We try and encourage as many to go back. Um, and that was a great day out. And then the next session we did, we went out and charred a boat out of Holt. And there are plenty of boats out of Dublin, Wicklow. So that's just from a, from a Dublin point of view. Absolutely, you can do great fishing all year round, pretty much. Different fish, different times of year. Um, just brilliant crack. Yeah, absolutely. And very different. So again, to, to try and keep in your mind, and this is what I'm hoping that we might be able to, to, to share with everyone here today, is that if, you, if you're into one type of fishing, to really give the others a go, because um, I grew up yeah. trout fishing. And, you know, it's only in later years I've started to get more into all the other types. And I don't know what I was missing. It was crazy. Like, I mean, going to a beach was a nightmare for me because I had to sit there and watch people go swimming. And I'm not particularly into swimming. And if I'd known, I just bought the beach caster with me and had a day out on the beach. And that's my absolute heaven now. Like, I can't think of anything nicer. And my kids are now doing it too. So it's brilliant. I've got a team on my side. Um, But so, yeah, look, we've got we've got fantastic uh, fishing in all the five disciplines in Ireland and give them a go give them a go and again come to us and we can help you point you in the right direction depending where you are in the country and we, if we can't bring you out ourselves we can definitely point you into where it might be a good place to go or a good place to start Okay, as, as somebody who was sat on the stones in Kilcool Beach in Wicklow at, at a young age for a long time I'm going to ask you for um, best beach to fish off North, south, east, and west, if you don't mind. And if you can agree on them. Um, but I think the, the east coast for me was cool, cool because that's where I, I was familiar with, but you might have a better one. Um, down the south, west, close to you, Andy, and uh, anything up the north coast you'd recommend? Mm. Let me think now. I'll have to have a think on that one, Frank. And, and um, not I'm not, you don't have to give away your your secret, your top class one. No, no. <laughs> um, Eastky. Eastky is very good up near Sligo. Yeah. Um, I fished it in the, when was it? Would have been August, September last year. And we had several different species. We fished a beach back um, from low tide in the run up to high. Um, and we had flounder and turbot. And then we moved around onto a rock mark then for the high tide and two hours passed. And we had garfish, mackerel, dogfish, pollock, and triggerfish off the rocks. Wow. So, you know, um, the, like I say, the, just the, the sheer number of species that you can catch is unbelievable. In the day. I mean, I'd never, I never even knew we had triggerfish in these waters until I caught one last year, That's you know? Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then going further up, I suppose, any of the Donegal beaches, Absolutely, there's some phenomenal fishing up there. We took a group of kids out last year um, on a stretch of beach that I didn't know if there was any fish there. And I only discovered after deciding we were going to set up, we were like, yeah, this looks lovely. This is grand, nice and safe for the kids and everything. And then some, some guys came down and went swimming and they were stood up 120 metres out and it just went to the waist. And I was like, oh, no, you're not going to catch any fish here. Um, and then the tide started coming in. And sure enough, we started catching dogfish one after another. You know, oh. so it just goes to show anywhere you go, this fish. Yeah, yeah. Um, I go East Coast then just to, to yeah, we, we, we fish Kilcoo. And Kilcoo is good from because it, it's close to Dublin, so you can get there kind of quick. Um, I used to say if you could get to Arklow, South Beach and Arklow is great because it's 
again, within an hour, just over an hour from Dublin, and it's a good distance. But if you can spend the extra little bit of time in traveling, the Wexford beaches are fantastic. Um, and a bit like Frank in Kilku, where the water gets deep quickly, you get down at your shelves quickly, and then you have those spits and bars just out in front of you. So the fish will run parallel with you. And if you're quiet <laughs> uh, at the start, you get incredible fish running them. So the, the Wexford beaches are within touching distance of a big city and it's they're just heavenly. Great crack. We were going to have, we were supposed to have the Arco was hosting the World Youth Championships um, in 2020, which has been postponed to, to hopefully this year, yeah. where all the U European teams will be coming with their, I think it's the under 16s and under 19s, but correct me if I'm wrong with that, I can't remember off the top of my head but that was going to be based in Arco but actually they were going to be fishing most of the beaches in Wexford because the beaches in Wexford are just <coughs> fantastic big long stretches of sandy beaches and plenty of room for everyone um, but if we're talking sea fishing for me it's the Mecca is West Cork really if you, if you have a chance for a weekend away if you want to go somewhere in Ireland to fish it's West Cork all day long <laughs> right, right. And, and, and again, off any beach, just pick your, pick your spot. So we have a, if you go onto the Angling in Ireland uh, website, you, uh, there's a good guide to the different beaches and spots. And we actually, I'll, I'll have to check and I'll see if, again, if you get in touch with me, because um, I think they're still in print, but we have little hand guides and each region in the country is available. And they're little kind of maybe 10 page booklets. Um, with, with all the different fishing spots and it literally goes along the coast and it gives you each little indent um, of, of the, now they're a little bit out of date probably at this stage but in general they're still really really good guides for where some go. good information in them yeah yeah they're, they're good and I know they are planning to, up, to update them soon um, it just depends on people being able to get out there and make sure that and, and go and fish those beaches and, and update them yeah 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 yeah. Uh, another question from Paul um Right, right. Uh, if, the, if there is a, a, a shed and a bunch of men set, setting up flies, is there any kind of funding from either ISMS or inland fisheries? Um, I, I'd say it's a low enough entry point with regards to expenses. But... Yeah, um, I can give you an idea on it. Expenses wise for, say, the pike flying in particular, because at the moment, um, getting ready for this project, I've just been buying all the materials in, um, and it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, I've bought enough materials in to tie in the region of 500 flies. Bearing in mind that 500 flies has got a retail value of, if you said a five or a fly, that's the minimum of a lot of money. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and the materials has cost less than 150 euro. Wow. You know, so and then it's just a case of time and uh, your vices. I suppose your biggest outlay is your fly vices and your fly tying kit, which they're not too expensive. We get we get these kits just from any normal tackle shop, and they come in at about twenty between twenty and twenty five euro for the full kit, and that comes with the vice, the scissors, your hackle pliers, um, your bobbin holder the whole kit and caboodle that you need with it. And then most of your stuff can be got cheaply online then, your materials. Yeah. And yeah. just on that, Paul, if you want to um, sign up for this with, with us, we'll provide you with all the vices and all the equipment for now, um, depending on when we can get out and we can start off and give this a run. And if you then want to go ahead and get your own gear for you, I think it's a really good one to keep going. Um, I can't promise it, but we, last year we had a funding call. Um, I think it was in... October was it, Andy? Hanging um, for all, yeah. Hanging for all, and I think it was up to five grand you could apply yeah. for um, for fishing equipment, for PPE, that kind of stuff. And I I don't have confirmation that that grant will be going again this year, but keep in touch with me, and we can let you know if it does come out because that's exactly what they want to spend the yeah. money on is for groups yeah, ideal. to to be able to get their own gear to to run exactly that so to um, to to tie flies and the like. So. Uh, Certainly try it out with us, and if you like it and you think it's a runner, then I'll let you know about the grant if it comes up again. That's that's fantastic and fantastic support. So really, no excuses for any shed interested <laughs> in looking for another activity um, where you know whether 
you've just got a bunch of men who aren't engaging with one or you, you want to try something. And um, that's, that's very kind and generous of your time and your expertise to get, to give it. Um, let's see now, there was a hands up, but no. Get another question. In. So I suppose the logical next steps are for anyone out there, any of the sheds out there to basically get in touch. You shared your email, hang on. There's a question. Sorry, back to see you. Uh, recommend yeah. the number of fishers on a boat so you guys can read that uh, so as to stop crossover lines. Yeah, that's um, largely depends on the experience of your anglers. But from, from my experience of it over the years, I try and keep numbers under 10 on a boat. Now, at the moment, you're only allowed six on a chart boat as it is with COVID restrictions. Um, but when things go back to normal or some sort of normality, try and keep under 10 is the ideal number. Eight really is perfect. Um, it gives everybody plenty of space, no matter which way you're running then against or with the tide, everybody's got room to let the lines down. Um, they should avoid made, you know, any major tangles. Uh, once you're getting on 12, I know a lot of boats are licensed for 12 and a lot of boats take 12 out. 12 is very tight on a boat. And check with your skipper as well. The, the skipper will know his boat better than anyone else and they'll be able to advise you and they might say we can fit 10 but you're better off with eight i think eight is a, is, is a good good number in general but yeah uh, check with your skipper first yeah and and look needless to say I, i'll say uh, safety 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 you know uh life jackets everything available refuse to go if you're not offered buoyancy equipment if you don't have your own um we, we, we can't say that enough, uh, the sea and water in general. It's a great place to play, but it's a great place to play safely. It's yeah. most important. Um, John Joseph Bradley, you're sticking your hand up. I'm sorry, I can't, um, I can't respond to you, but if you want to pop a question in the Q&A. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, been able to, oh, sorry, he's been unable to get into the meeting. Our internet has been down all morning. All right. <laughs> Technical question there. I hope you're in now because you've sent a message um, and there will be a full recording of today's meeting with thanks to Andy and Rory because uh, I need, we need their permission to record it and uh, it, it, it'll be very much just circulated around some men's sheds and won't be broadcast live as to all these great tips we're getting and uh, secret locations too. <laughs> um, so I suppose in summary, like it's, it, you know, we live on an island we, we are just blessed with the natural resources we have inland and offshore um, and along our coast. If anybody is remotely interested, please engage with Inland Fisheries. Contact me. I will put you directly in touch with Andy and Rory. Um, yes, we're in lockdown now, but there's so much to look forward to as we come out of it. And there's so much fishing and there's so much great fun that can be had because it's called fishing, not catching as I'm often reminded. Um, but there's skills that can be learned before we go out and before you go out. And there's, which is a great thing, again, to repeat what Andy said, that there's a great revenue streams to be engaged in if you're lucky enough to have a shed in an area that is, a, is a, known for its angling. You can, be, uh, you can be tying flies and upcycling rods and, and very much making some hard-earned for the shed uh, to keep everybody else going. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Rory, and thank you very much, Andy. It, it's really been a pleasure, and, and, and thank you for your expertise and your time. And, and I don't think this is the end of the conversation, because as you, you kindly offered to go into any shed, talk about programmes, and, and we'll be in touch. And, and we, we'll, I'm planning we're all going to be at a lockdown, hopefully by the end of the summer. And... Um, We'd love to. Uh, we'd love to have a have another chat and hopefully in person. Uh, one last question coming in there, Brendan Walsh. Um, do fish in an area along a canal pass on the word? Fishers are around. Yes, they do. They have their own internet. <laughs> we're told um, those fish. <laughs> the ones you see in the fish shops are the ones that don't get the internet messages from the other fish. One thing we always struggle to explain to the kids is the fish don't like noise. There's no getting away from that. Uh, if you make noise, the fish will be gone. 
yeah. which is another reason why fish and canals are so used to noise they, they, than people that they, they know how to hide very well from you. City fish. City fish, exactly. Streetwise. <laughs> uh, Eugene Perry wants to know, do you eat pike? Oh. <laughs> I don't, but I know people no, I don't. have. Yeah. Um, do you, Andy? Uh, no. No, we, I don't. No, I would always release them. All our, all our pike in this country, we should probably say that actually, yeah, no, all pike in Ireland are catch and release. Um, I would encourage catch and release for every fish I catch. Um, you, you'll find that most anglers who really get into it really put nearly everything they catch back. Um, now, for pike, you do have to put them back. For salmon, you have to check the rules and the regulations, and that changes from river to river, lake to lake. Um, and some put and take lakes, like the one I mentioned earlier on, we went to Ockham last time at the Bluebell Shed. And I think in that lake, you can take uh, one trout each home. And that's part of the price of entry. Um, and in others, they, they want you to put them all back. So again, just check before you go. But in general, I would always encourage catch and release because we, we want to look after them. We want to look after the fishing and the, and the resource in general so that it's there for our kids and their kids. And if we, uh, if we carry on like the previous few generations who think like to demonstrate how many hundred fish they caught in a photograph on the bank, well, that's part of the reason we're in trouble now. So we want to try and really encourage people to put back as many as they can. Um, so yeah, I don't eat yeah. pike. <laughs> no, don't eat pike. Don't eat pike. Listen, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed and for your time. And we really appreciate it. And we, we'll be in touch and we keep the conversation going. Um, Thanks a lot, uh, Frank. Take care. Thanks very much indeed. All Thanks, Dad. Cheers, Dad. Bye, Bye, Bye. Bye.